Hello and welcome to week 2, part 3 of EGM 703, Hyperspectral Image Analysis 2, 2 Hype 2 Image. In this lesson, we'll look at a few more methods that we can use to analyze hyperspectral images, including a few that we've seen before. We can create normalized difference indices or perform band arithmetic with hyperspectral images, just like we do with multispectral images. The main difference is we have a much, much larger number of band combinations that we can try to exploit. We've seen the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, before. This is just the difference between the reflectance in the near-infrared and the red divided by the sum of the reflectance in the near-infrared and the red. With hyperspectral images, we normally have multiple bands in each of these different wavelength ranges. This figure shows how well the NDVI correlates to wet biomass as a function of band combinations for two crops, soybeans and cotton. From this, we can see that the optimal choice of band combination differs between the two crops. For cotton, the highest correlation value comes with a near-infrared wavelength of around 920 nanometers and a red wavelength of 680 nanometers, while for soybeans, the ideal range is between 800 and 900 nanometers in the near-infrared and about 710 nanometers for the red wavelength. Continuing the theme of methods we've seen before, I'm going to use the next few slides to refresh your memory on different machine learning techniques, starting with decision trees. Recall that a decision tree is similar to a flowchart. We have input data and a series of steps to follow to determine what to classify that input data as. We have nodes in our decision tree where we test different attributes. For example, here we have a node where we're looking at the value in band 1, which might be, for example, the red band, and we're classifying or dividing our data into two different groups based on whether the pixel values are bright or dark in the red band. After that, we move on to our next set of nodes in order co to continue the process until we get to our final classification at layer where each pixel value has been assigned to a class. The branches of our decision tree are the particular test outcomes that we have. For the band one example here, one branch is where the pixel value is bright, or above 82, and one where the value is dark, less than or equal to 82. Leaf nodes are the final nodes where we have our class labels. Here we have wetlands, dead vegetation, bare soil, and water. Another way to think about this is that we are recursively partitioning our data set into more and more homogeneous subsets of that data. We're starting with objects or pixel values as an input and returning classes at the output. When we talked about machine learning, we mentioned that there are three main approaches to machine learning. First, we have unsupervised machine learning. This is where we provide the machine with no information about the input data and essentially ask it to sort or categorize or find the structure that is present in the data. In supervised machine learning, we provide the machine with a labeled input data that it then uses to figure out what the function or the pattern is that determines how to classify that data. Then, when we provide the machine with new, unlabeled data, it uses the pattern that's, that it has learned in order to label the new data. Finally, we have reinforcement learning, where depending on the outcomes or actions that the machine learning algorithm takes, we reward it or punish it based on whether the action it, help, it takes helps it to achieve the goal that we've put in place. In remote sensing, the most prevalent approach is supervised machine learning, which is what most of the examples that we'll continue with fall under. An artificial neural network, or ANN, is designed to mimic how a human or animal brain works. It's a network of different connected nodes that can communicate with each other or transmit signals to each other. Each of the different nodes is known as a neuron. Again, this is all based on how we understand human brains to actually function, where we have different neurons that are communicating with each other in order to process all of the different things that our brains process. Each of these different connections has a weight that is adjusted as the network learns. We can have more communication between particular neurons, we can have less communication, 
These are the things that are tweaked or the knobs that are turned as we train up the neural network. The neuron is something that processes a particular input signal or value that then outputs a value to the next neuron in the network using a nonlinear function that is known as an activation or transfer function. And this is just a way of determining whether the neuron will transmit a signal or activate to the next neuron or not. Once or if the neuron transmits the signal to other neurons, they can move on to the next layers in the network. Eventually, from our initial inputs, we have outputs that are, at least in our case, thematic, thematic map classes. At the end of this, we have a classified map. Each of these neurons are aggregated into different layers, which are also sometimes called hidden layers, and we can have any number of different layers that help build up our network. This figure comes from a 2012 study by Zhang and Jia that combined hyperspectral data, object-based properties such as texture, and different image classification algorithms, including spectral angle mapping, support vector machine, and an artificial neural network. In this study, the authors used Avarice data in the Everglades, Florida, USA, to try to classify different vegetation types. They tested whether the minimum noise fraction helped to improve the classification results, finding that it did. The classifications using the reduced data set with the top 15 minimum noise fraction layers had a kappa value of over 0.84 compared to a value of 0.52 with the full data set. The artificial neural network showed better performance than the other classification methods tested. The highest kappa value for the other methods was the support vector machine at 0.86. With the artificial neural network, kappa values ranged between 0.89 and 0.94 depending on the size of the training data used. Including object-based texture properties was extremely useful with an accuracy of 100% for mangrove swamps, which is an important land cover type in the Florida Everglades. The authors also found high accuracy for identification of invasive plant species, again an important consideration for critical wetland habitats such as the Everglades. This study combines a number of different approaches that we've introduced before. Object-based analysis, machine learning methods, and hyperspectral analyses. A 2011 study by Licciardi and Del Frate combined another approach that we've introduced, spectral unmixing, with artificial neural networks. And always, always you can check this paper out in the module library. Another type of machine learning algorithm that we've introduced previously is the support vector machine, or SVM. The aim behind using a support vector machine is to find the location of a decision boundary in order to separate different classes. So, if we're given two different classes, here represented by the red and yellow dots, denoted by class A and class B respectively, then our goal is to find the line, or hyperplane, that leaves the greatest margin or space between the two classes. The margin is just the distance between the hyperplane and the closest points in each of the different classes. These closest points are known as support vectors, which is where we get the name. If our classes are not linearly separable, that is, there's no simple way to differentiate between them, maybe we have some overlap between the two classes, for example, then the goal is to find the hyperplane that maximizes the margin while also minimizing the misclassification. Rather than using a single line here, we might end up with a piecewise hyperplane that separates the different classes. Originally, a support vector machine w uh, was developed for binary classification problems, but we can easily adapt it to multi-class applications. Like other machine learning methods, support vector machines are an ideal method for analyzing hyperspectral data. They're highly generalizable, meaning that they're flexible and adapt to many applications. The cost function, which is how we actually find the hyperplane, uh, is convex. And what this means is that we can identify an optimal solution. That's something that we want because it means that we can actually solve the problem. Support vector machine uh, is also well suited to ill-posed problems, which most hyperspectral classification applications are. A well-posed problem is one where a solution exists, 
The solution is unique and the solution is stable, meaning that small changes in the initial conditions change the solution in a, quote, nice way. Ill-posed problems, on the other hand, violate at least one of those conditions. The solution may not exist, there may not be many solutions, or there may be many solutions, or the solutions may be unstable. Changes in the initial conditions may change the uh, results in unpredictable ways. So in addition to all of these nice reasons, support vector machines also don't take much effort for us to set up relative to other methods. In this study by Del Ponte and others from 2009, they tested three different classification methods for classifying trees in a hyperspectral image. Support vector machines, Gaussian maximum likelihood with a leave one out covariance estimator, and linear discriminant analysis. They also varied the spectral resolution of the data set by averaging the values in adjacent bands. Starting with the full resolution data set of 4.6 nanometers, they averaged every two bands to get 9.2 nanometers, every three to get 13.8, and so on. From the graphs that you can see here, support vector machine, the black circles, uh, outperformed the other two methods in both of the study areas, and especially with the higher resolution data sets. The study area on the left, Bosco de la Fontana, is a much more complicated forest for classification as it is a natural forest reserve with 19 different species to classify, while the Val di Sella study area has only six tree species. And you can see how the SVM classification does better in both cases, but especially, or it's more noticeably, in the more complicated application. So, in this lesson, we've seen how many of the approaches that we've introduced in other modules, such as machine learning or spectral indices, can still be applied to hyperspectral data. In particular, machine learning algorithms can be especially useful, as they are often suited to applications where we have large amounts of information. As always, though, the choice of algorithm we use is going to depend on the data we have and the application that we're interested in. There aren't really any one-size-fits-all algorithms. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in the textbooks, uh, Jensen chapters 10 and 11. For an additional refresher on some of the topics we've covered here, I've linked to the EGM 702 lessons on image segmentation and object-based image analysis, machine learning, and machine learning classification. If you don't still have access to the slides for those lessons, let me know and I'll make them available. I've also included links to the different papers referenced in this lesson, and of course there are more examples available in the Zotero group library for the module. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!